My name is Kenneth Harris. I go by Kenny. I am currently a senior engineer with NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. I've been there for the past 12 years, six missions. I've done everything from radiation to integration testing. Now I work on satellite asset protection or space asset protection. I wanted to start with sort of your current work because it's uh, yeah. it's very interesting to think about, you know, how to defend satellites from <coughs> cyber threats, other types of threats. I think that's a part of satellite research that a lot of people don't know a lot about. There are actually two parts to uh, asset protection. There's a physical aspect aspect of it and there's a cyber aspect of it. One of the higher physical threats have to do with collisions of some sort, whether it is intentional or unintentional. You know, intentional, I mean another satellite literally ramming into your satellite or unintentional being space debris, space trash, just any, you know, decommissioned satellites or just anything that's floating around in the orbit. Another thing that we have to deal with is actually grappling of satellites. And it, it, it sounds just like it is. It's, it's literally a satellite grappling onto yours and trying to interface with its ports or anything of that nature. <laughs> um, and then uh, something lastly we deal with is called uh, Tempest. And Tempest is essentially information leakage due to electromagnetic signals or disruptions and things of that nature. And that has to do with a satellite getting too close to your satellite, like within its proximity and trying to, you know, cause damage to the mission that you're working on. On the flip side, all those are physical. On the flip side, cyber threats are kind of like a longer process. You have to really think about it from end to end with the satellite. A cyber attacks can have different targets anywhere from the ground team to the RF links to the uh, actual space vehicle itself, as well as even the parts of the satellite is made out of. So you have to, you know, think about supply chain. You have to think about where your parts are coming from, X, Y, Z, because it, it, get, it, get, it actually gets that deep in terms of, um, you know, cyber threats and trying to secure it from that. Yeah, and I wonder if you could just uh, get a little bit, elaborate a little bit more about the um, the cyber threats in, in terms of where, where there are vulnerabilities. Have satellites been hacked in the past? Where are the places that, that people look for vulnerabilities? And what, what is the purpose of a, a cyber uh, attack on a satellite? Uh, what would someone, what would a bad actor be trying to do there? So for example, if you have a satellite that is built on let's just say one network instead of several. Um, and by one network, I'm, I can mean something as simple as, um, you know, the communications is tied to their, um, you know, sensors for their thermal data or something like that. A bad actor could essentially go into the network and increase the temperature of the satellite and thus it, it basically burns it up from the inside. These can be for a number of malicious reasons. Um, it's really too many to count, but but this is something that, again, that we have to be cognizant of as we try to mitigate each and every one of these risks. While Kenny has worked on a wide variety of projects at NASA, one of his main areas of focus has been the James Webb Space Telescope. The James Webb Space Telescope, or Webb, or JWST, as we sometimes call it, um, is often seen as the successor to the wildly popular Hubble Space Telescope. This telescope is essentially an orbiting infrared observatory that will live in a Lagrange II orbit or an L2 orbit, approximately 2 million miles from Earth. So the way we like to think about it is Webb is essentially a time machine, or you think about it as like a time telescope. Its infrared vision will let us see back over 13.5 billion years to see some of the first stars and galaxies that were actually formed in the galaxy. Uh, this will allow us to observe early universes. The understanding of the universes will help our astronomers um, compare and see how these different galaxies and stuff like that are formed. You'll take a, a shot that Webb has next to how we see galaxies now, and their hope is to understand how we got from point A to point B. Webb will also continue to uh, both complement and extend the discoveries of Hubble, since he'll operate with uh, longer wavelengths without the light of either Earth or other bodies like that disrupting his field of view. It will be able to see through some of those massive, massive uh, dust clouds that you see. Um, an example of dust clouds is a really popular Hubble image called either the Eagle Nebula or sometimes people call it the pillars of creation, and that's seen mm -hmm. uh, with visible light. Now, if you look at that same picture with infrared light, the number of stars and bodies in that is, is, is breathtaking. A story about James Webb is that actually when they first asked me to work on it, I turned it down. I was mm -hmm. in my early 20s, I want to say, and they basically said, hey, we need you to go work on James Webb. And 
at this time, my career I was really um, monetarily focused and I wasn't really thinking where a project could take my career. So I, I told them no. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not interested in doing that. I'd rather, um, you know, continue. I was managing an electronics lab at this time. So I was like, I'll just continue doing that. I went back, I talked to one of my mentors and he <laughs> he was like, you're crazy. Go back and tell them, yes, you'll do it. It doesn't matter if they pay you less to do it. Um, and I'm so, I'm so glad I listened to him. I'm so glad I actually ended up doing that because just how how much experience I gained from that project uh, is you, you can't you can't put a price tag on that. And in terms of springboarding my career, um, it's done it's done so much just for me in different areas in terms of uh, leadership, in terms of um, going back to school, in terms of uh, being able to have these stories to tell other you know younger uh, engineers or explorers or what have you, and encourage them to get into the field. That was an amazing project to work on. And not to mention, I got a ton of really cool pictures with the satellite that, you know, <laughs> I can brag about for years to come. That actually kind of leads me to, um, you know, something I read in an interview with you where you you noted that there's a very artistic aspect to a lot of these satellites. Even though they're functional, they have this beautiful kind of aesthetic to them. And that's certainly true for James Webb. How much does that aesthetic stuff inspire you and um, and kind of make you, you know, involved and engaged in your in your job? When you literally look at James Webb next to, you know, any of the other missions I've worked on, or really any mission that I can think of, like even when you look at the the gold panels, you have to know that even that gold plating has a purpose. It's not just, you know, to say, oh, we have gold on the front of our satellite or it looks nice. It actually serves a purpose for the overall mission. Um, so when you look at the aesthetics or the 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 beauty behind these technologies. Um, I would say I have a specific um, respect and appreciation for it just because when I was young, I started off drawing. I wanted to be an artist um, at some point in time. Uh, and I did a lot of sketching. I was really I was really big into sketching Pokemon when I was young and like the original ones, not like all the tons that are out now. I'm talking like, you know, Charizard and all that. So I was, I was really into sketching stuff like that. Um, and so when I figured out, I can actually tie that into engineering just on a, a 3D platform. So CAD modeling and things like that. When I found out I could draw just in three dimension and it'd be, you know, something something bigger than an imaginary Pokemon or something bigger than just a sketch that I was putting together. I really, really got more involved in engineering um, as a whole. You know, speaking of drawing Pokemon as a kid, you, you really got involved with NASA very early. You were you were a teenager. So uh, I'd love to hear about what how that transition to uh, to to working for NASA kind of happened for you. Were you always interested in space or did it kind of emerge from your interest in engineering? So my interest in engineering was really, um, I was fortunate enough to have my father in my life who, who was an engineer. Um, he's an engineer at NASA. Mm. He's been there since I was born. So I actually spent a lot of time at the center. And a, a story I like to share is that uh, my dad my dad worked a lot. And well, both my parents worked really hard. So sometimes uh, my dad would have to leave work, pick me up from school, me and my sister up from school, and bring us back to his office. Uh, so after school, I'd do homework in, at his office at NASA, just him and his his office mate, who actually was an, who was an artist, and he's someone who kind of helped me hone my my drawing and artistic skills and things of that nature. Um, but my dad, underneath his desk, had a really really um, thick piece of foam that they had used on another mission that they weren't using anymore, um, that they just stored in his office for whatever reason. So when I came uh, from school, did my homework, I would actually take naps on this little foam mattress. You know, for me, it's huge because I'm a, I'm a middle schooler. So for me, it's huge. So, I, you know, I would take naps on that after school. And those are, those are some of the memories I have from, um, you know, being at NASA at a very young age. But I transitioned into what was called the high school internship program when I was 16. And that helped me to work on projects through the school year, was with NASA my whole undergraduate career. This was my graduate career, and then it eventually turned to a full-time job after undergrad. What would be your advice to someone who might watch this interview and might be interested in space or engineering, but doesn't really know the pathways to get into it? A young person, perhaps in, in you know high school as you were, uh, what's the best way for them to start kind of making that path for themselves? The best advice, I could give to someone striving to specifically come into the space industry. Don't give up. There are so many challenges along this path that I've seen knock a lot of people off the path. 
<laughs> and it's those of us that have kept the course, that have not become complacent in our roles, and that have really buckled down that made it through. I think, again, another really important part of being an engineer is constantly challenging yourself um, because it, it, it makes you constantly learn as the business continues to develop. And then I just wanted to cap off by asking, like, is there a dream mission? I mean, you've already worked on James Webb, so that's pretty great. But <laughs> is there a particular type of mission that you would really, really like to work on that you haven't yet? I, I do have goals of becoming an astronaut at some point. I did apply to the last mm -hmm. astronaut selection program. So that's that's another thing that I'm really, really considering. So I guess if we say mission, you know, a moon mission would be really cool. <laughs> Even a mission to ISS would be really cool. I hope to, you know, contribute my my skills and continue to be assets and asset in, in whatever way I can. I always like my missions to be uh, for the greater good. So I hope that answers your question, but, but yeah, I'd say astronaut. That definitely answers my question. I uh, didn't expect it to be yeah, getting into the human side of space flight. That is so cool. Yeah, and I'm, yeah. I'm do all the best for that because yeah, I hope to see you up there Thank one day. You. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I know it's a it's a tough process. It's definitely a definitely a tough process. Yeah. But again, you never know unless you unless you try. So, you know, exactly. I'm not going to back down from that challenge. <laughs>